Welcome to today's ECHO session uh, on ODMAP. Uh, we're going to be talking, discussing um, data entry and management of the ODMAP system. And Emily, do you want to do some housekeeping tips? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you can see up in the left corner, we're being recorded. This session will be available after um, later this afternoon, and it'll be on our YouTube channel. And we'll also send it out next time we announce um, the echo call. If you have not done so already, I'd like to invite you to mute yourself and please don't be offended if we mute you during the call. Towards the end of the hour, I will share a link. Um, it's an anonymous evaluation link. Um, just a couple questions for us to get feedback on how we can improve these sessions for you. And I would also like to request that everybody um, share their name and tribal, intertribal affiliation in the chat. We're trying to see how um, wider reach these are getting. And that is all I have. Great, thank you. Um, we can go ahead and turn it over to Mark Tuttle and Vicki Bradley. All right. So I got a short presentation and a video, and then if we we're supposed to have uh, somebody from EMS hop on, not quite sure if he was able to hop on here, but uh, he was he's our um, um, OD Map administrator. So hopefully he can hop on and oh, there he looks like he just hopped on. So Zach Stutz is his name. So we'll, but we'll go over our PowerPoint presentation first and then I'll turn it over to Zach and he can talk a little bit about entering the data. And, okay. All right, can y'all see that? Can you still see it? All right, so uh, this is gonna be about the data entry management and setting alerts. Here, let me share it this way. There it goes. Okay, uh, data entry. So the manual entry allows first responders, including law enforcement, fire, EMS, personnel, hospitals, and medical examiners to log an overdose while on scene in their vehicles or when they return to their offices. Data can be entered via mobile device, tablet, or in, in the, at the computer. Uh, authority to enter data is granted by the agency administrator. So we'll go through, um, how y'all entered the data. Uh, Zach will do that momentarily. And managing duplicate data. So this is something that's pretty neat that ODMAP does. So ODMAP checks all suspected overdose submissions to mitigate data duplication. Once a submission is confirmed by the user, the system checks for an existing submissions that are within 285 feet in one hour before or after. I'm not quite sure why they picked 285 feet, but it seems to work for them, I guess. Uh, if there are any potential duplicate submissions, uh, the system will return a warning message and with the contact information of the users who submitted the potential duplicate entry and verified whether the entry should be submitted. Uh, spike alerts. So this is a early warning and proactive public safety preparedness measure. So the spike alerts are intended to, so you'll put in for it. Um, if it reaches a certain threshold within the 24 hour period, then you'll get an email saying, hey, there's a spike alert. And then if it, the spike alert continues, then you'll keep getting that email every day until the spike alert ends, and that's when it falls below the certain threshold. So what is a spike alert? 
So as I said, uh, it notifies the agency by email if the total overdoses in the area exceeds a predetermined threshold within a 24-hour period. Spike alerts can be established for an agency's own county as well as nearby or neighboring counties. By establish establishing spike alerts for nearby counties, the program can serve as an early warning system. If a spike is overdose occurs in neighboring county, officials can anticipate a spike in their area and prepare. So that's one thing they don't have it set up for tribal areas, but you can, if your tribe is in um, different counties, then they'll uh, just want to set it up as a spike alert for the county. Uh, creating spike alerts. So you'll go to your manage, then alerts. Um, then from there, then you'll uh, select the state of interest, the county of interest, uh, select the incident type. Um, then you'll enter the threshold. So that's how many overdoses that will trigger, trigger the alert. Um, then from there, you'll create the custom spike alert message and then enter the subscriptions, subscribers. So who all would get that um, alert once it does hit that certain threshold and automatically in box seven is to automatically update threshold. By checking this box, this threshold will be automatically adjust to as ODMAP recommends value changes. And this is an example of uh, spike alert email down here at the bottom so it has a specific message that they had go out to all the people in the uh, spike alert uh, email list. And then you can also create overdose alerts. So this is just for one uh, overdose. So if you want to get alerted for every overdose, you can create this. And it's the same thing as a spike alert, except you'll just get an email for each and every spike or each and every overdose. Uh, creating statewide alerts. Alerts will be created for when uh, any county and state experiences a spike. For a statewide alert, ODMAP spike formula must be used. The threshold will be automatically updated according to data submitted. Uh, statewide alerts must be for both fatal and non-fatal. and spike alerts in action. So the Baltimore uh, City Health Department solicited technical assistance to develop a free anonymous text messaging service called Bad Batch Alert. Uh, this alert allows active users or their loved ones to register with the service and receive text alerts when there is a spike in overdoses. So whenever, if you set that certain alert say five overdoses within a 24 hour period in a certain county, then all those people that are registered receive that spike alert. The bad batch alert serves as a built-in suit of commands, including quick access to a 24 hour crisis line at real time notification of a needle exchange van's current location and access to a naloxone training schedule. The Bad Batch Alert service uses the data from EMS as analyzed for overdose spikes by an epidemiologist from Behavioral Health Service or Systems Baltimore. Spike alerts identified from the OD map system could be used to trigger the multi, multi jurisdictional alerts. And then this is just a help desk link or their information. So they're very respondent. Uh, whenever I contacted them, that's I never had an issue. Email them or call them. They they help you out very um, very well whenever you have any issues. So just want to make sure you all know that. And then this is a video here. Can play. I think everybody in our community has a story of someone they knew uh, who has unfortunately passed away. I've lost a sister, she's died from an overdose. In my family, we had a 30 year run with this. So I had a lot of experience, experience the good, experience the bad, I've raised her children. For me, it was a good friend, uh, uh, one of our council members' son. Uh, we had 
uh, two previous reversals on him. We were able to keep him alive after two overdoses. Uh, was doing very well with treatment and out of nowhere uh, relapsed, used again. So there's a lot that affects people that we don't realize and it affects everybody. My name's Cheryl Moore and I've started uh, with public health many years ago. My position at the county now in public health is I'm the director of the Opiate Task Force. And my name is Brian Gould. I'm the assistant chief of the Town of Chicktawaga Police Department outside of the city of Buffalo. Substance use has always been housed in the mental health department. And there were no resources at all, no staffing. It's not someone that's disenfranchised. It's affecting everyone. We were responding to, uh, to, to a lot of overdoses, and I started to hear the burnout in the guys. The guys frustrated that they're going to the same house more than once a week, uh, reversing the same person maybe twice in a day. It wasn't the officer, it was a system that I needed to fix, and, and that's you know one of the things that led to uh, our relationship with the health department. Before ODMAP, uh, I never really worked with Cheryl. I think it was really practical, the tool of ODMAP, when we brought it to town. We have 25 police departments in Erie County. We brought all 25 departments together for a presentation from the Washington Baltimore HIDA. Before they left the room, they all signed up for their accounts. I basically told Cheryl, I will tell you everybody who's overdosing in my town. I'll give you a copy of every police report that for every overdose that we respond, will you be able to get the people help? And Cheryl jumped in and said, of course. We have real-time data when overdoses occur. In Erie County, New York, the, the information is put in in real time. Officers do it in their cars. It takes seconds, literally, in the car. We did it as a briefing training, a 10-minute PowerPoint and briefing before the guys went on the road. Me being the, the impatient person I am, I said, uh, Cheryl, why do I have to wait for somebody to overdose? If, if my officers know somebody who's struggling, can I just refer them to you? ODMAP was the tool that allowed us to talk. For us, it's just really helped us form this relationship where uh, law enforcement and public health are working together to address uh, the problems in our community and uh, the, the numbers speak for themselves. At the peak of the epidemic in the 2016-2017 calendar year, we were seeing over 160 overdoses per year. This past year, 2019, I believe we saw 63 overdoses in the whole year. ODMAP is a very simple program to implement in a department. It was a free tool that didn't cost us anything to, to implement it, and it, it was really a no-brainer for us. I don't know where that will take other departments, but I know it's at least a first step to help the people who do live in their communities and who are struggling with addiction. All right. And that's all that I have to share. Um, if Zach can unmute and you can, you can um, go through and talk about uh, how you go about entering the data in OD map. Okay. Zach, we can't hear you. Can you speak up a little bit? Great, is that working a little bit better now? Yes. Okay, awesome. So can everyone, Able to see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when you log into the OD Maps, uh, first off, hello everybody. My name is Zach. I'm the education captain at Cherokee Tribal EMS here. Uh, so just wanted to say hello to everyone. Um, very happy to present to y'all today. If you have any questions, just let me know. And even after the meeting, you're more than welcome to, to reach out. Um, so EMS kind of took over putting in all, all these things. We started this about two years ago. Uh, we're currently still trying to get to real-time entry. Uh, right now we have about 99% of our uh, overdoses entered within 24 hours, but we're still post-incident. We're, we're working with the police department uh, who received a grant to try to get uh, real-time entry so that we can be a little bit more responsive and, and proactive with this. Uh, and myself and one of the person here at EMS, we have access to do quality assurance for all of our EMS patient care reports. Uh, and then we take that information uh, from there and put it into uh, OD maps. So as you're looking at OD maps, once you log in uh, from your screen, this it brings up straight to the, the first screen where you're gonna enter everything. Uh, most of this information is pretty just generic demographic stuff, but you would simply put in uh, you can use an address, uh, but what I have found is, at least here on uh, 
uh, within the Koala boundary that there a lot of addresses don't work out very well, that they can't find them on Google Maps or something like that. So uh, with the advice when we did the, the onboard training, uh, we utilize this Latin long uh, find it here. So it does a lot better with finding addresses or it will get you at least to a map that is very close to where we can kind of pinpoint where we expect that address to be. And uh, so I think like one would be Apparently that's not going to work out today. Uh, so, but once it gets your Latin and long on there, then you can hit the use coordinates and type it in there. Uh, it does a pretty good job of finding it and it will give you a summary of it at the end to make sure that you do have the correct place. Uh, the case number is kind of a local thing. If you assign a case number to it, we normally don't uh, assign one of those because since we are the only agency putting these uh, data points in, uh, we can quite easily find them by cross-referencing with our patient care reports because it's going to give you a date and time that the incident occurred so that allows us to find those uh, data reports and patient care reports that way uh, we do put an age gender uh, your primary suspected drug and we've been done some training with our staff that if the, the person can give either they admit to it or somebody else on scene can admit to what they're using then we use it off of that uh, if not, we kind of use our, our best guess, of course, we can, uh, I, I trust, trust their clinical judgment on uh, what type of substance that, that may have been abused there. Uh, and you can add additional drugs or suspected drugs here and holding the control button, you can click as many as you, as you need to off of uh, this screen here. Uh, they, they do a pretty good job of having a very comprehensive list uh, from the EMS report, I can tell if they were taken to the hospital, yes or no. I think that's one advantage of having uh, EMS involved in the data entry because uh, law enforcement or other first responders may not always know. They may have had to clear the scene before uh, we, we found out if they were transported or not. Uh, multiple overdose victim incident. We have had some of those where there are multiple people in the same uh, residence or house or multiple people overdosed in that area at one point in time. Uh, that is a simple yes or no. Uh, was there a motor vehicle involved? Simple yes or no. Uh, did anybody administer naloxone? And this is kind of like overall for the whole case, did somebody uh, do it? I have found that you you can only select one of these. Uh, so it does become a little bit problematic when say a bystander gave naloxone and then EMS arrived and we had to give it administer a dose as well. Um, I've always just kind of gone with the first person to do it. And that way, whether it's correct or not, at least we're consistent, I guess, is, is our biggest thing. We've reached to try to remain as consistent as possible. Uh, when you're using OD maps, there, there are two biggest distinguishing factors is you have your non-fatal overdoses and fatal overdoses. Within those categories, um, you have naloxone was not administered. I don't know if it was administered. Maybe they said they did, but there's no proof of it on, on site. There's no uh, containers or empty cartridges or anything like that. They just said they used naloxone. Uh, you had to give a single dose or more than one dose, and it does break it down, which I found very handy, uh, into the milligrams administered because some of our auto injectors we found have uh, sometimes four milligrams, or I've even seen an eight milligram auto injector before. Uh, so even though they got a single dose, we documented it as a multiple dose because it, they got that such a large dose of naloxone in, in terms of milligrams. So it was able to distinguish that, which was uh, helpful, just kind of keeping in the, in the back of your mind, did they get it intranasally or IV? Uh, and we just used the IV doses whenever we had, we were there for a little while, we had some intramuscular Narcan going around that was an auto injector as well. Uh, and so we just used the same IV dose for that because in the EMS world, it would be the same IV doses as how we would dose it as a provider. Uh, so I'm gonna just enter some uh, some random information there to try to get us to the next screen. I 
I just knew that that's the address of our the casino, so I knew that it was on was going to be in there. It'll turn green when it's good to go. Uh, it does auto populate your your coordinates for you. We'll just put pretty generic very quickly. Uh, so it does give you a warning that hey you're you're saving this in this is a, a legit thing uh, your map shows up so you can make sure you have the correct place on there i think one time i forgot the negative in front of my longitude and i ended up somewhere in the middle of the pacific ocean and so that obviously wasn't correct but it does give you a nice little picture there to make sure that you are like, somewhere where close to where you want to be uh, you can select the date uh, the time increments are just 15 minutes i normally do from the time that ems was called and I'll go back through and I'll delete this one from here momentarily. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and submit it. And then you can go in to enter the next one and it, and it goes in. Uh, so if I did want to uh, find it, then up on the top, uh, the administrator should have this. You have different levels to where uh, some folks may be able to just enter the overdoses. Some people can just use the data from the, the information. Uh, provided, but we can go in and manage overdoses. And so here's this one that was on today. It's right here. We can go ahead and delete that one. Saying that, yes, I, I do want to delete it. It was me. This is the one I just put in. So we can go ahead and delete that one on accident. This is just where you can manage it. If you wanted to search for a, a different overdose, you can also go up here uh, and you can search your records by a number of different fields. You can go by date, time, uh, say, I just know it was a, a male and, and they over to sometime in May. And, and we can, we can search that. We haven't had any, any yet. So, uh, you can also export those to Excel. So what we have found is like, if I wanted to search for the last month or so, then I can export that to Excel pretty easily and have a very good uh, report on that. Uh, the next little bit over here is you, you have your agency that you can manage. Uh, that first one that Mark alluded to there, or you can manage your alerts. We'll get there eventually. Uh, so basic demographic information, the screen looks exactly like this, the screenshots did. Uh, I did delete one of ours so that I could add it again for us. Uh, and so like he said, it does not uh, specifically limit to just the, the koala boundary to our, to our reservation. Uh, but since we do populate, have areas in both Swain and Jackson counties within the state of North Carolina, uh, we would have a spike alert for Swain, as you see down here at the bottom. Uh, to where we do have the spike alerts for, for Swain here. And then we can set another one. And this is the pretty neat thing is that as soon as I do that, uh, it uses data and I believe the lowest number it goes is three. So it actually recommends a spike alert threshold uh, for you. All the times that I've entered these in, it's always suggested three, so I'm not sure uh, that it goes any lower, but as far as I know, uh, we're the only entity using OD maps in both Swain and Jackson County. I think Macon County, which is another county over from us, is utilizing it. Uh, so from this data, they're probably just utilizing our data there. Uh, I would, I can do fatal or non-fatal. We just go ahead and leave it as both. And even if I don't want three, I can put one to to th to trigger that spike alert. Uh, I would highly not recommend putting one in because every time you just enter in a overdose, that's going to give you a, a, a spike alert. That's going to be, uh, they call some like kind of uh, alarm deafness to where it doesn't, you, you get those emails all the time, then you may just start deleting those emails and not paying attention to them a whole lot. Uh, and we can almost guarantee there's always going to be at least one overdose. That's why the system is in existence. Uh, so we'll go with their recommendation of three. You can change the email subject or you can have just the generic one that they use. We really just kind of leave it generic. 
I can only think of two times that we've had a spike alert. Um, and I was actually on scene for both of those. So we had it within about 10 minutes of the overdoses, we were able to do it. And it ended up being a multiple victim uh, incident that we had on, on, on scene. So then I would just go ahead and create this. Maybe it's loading again. You have to make sure that there's people to send the alert to before you try to create it. So that is created. I can see where it is down here. So I have the, the spike alerts. Uh, there's, it looks like I've duplicated Swain there. Uh, you can edit and delete these from here pretty easily. Uh, not really much of a, a problem there. The create overdose alert functions the same exact way as before. You're going to choose your state, your county, your incident. It's still going to be both. Uh, you can put as many subscribers as you would like on there. Uh, with us doing post-incident data entry, uh, we've not created any overdose alerts there. That's something that we could very easily do uh, and, and may do there in the future, but since all of ours are post, it does not provide uh, like where the video alluded to a bad batch or something like that because we're still uh, like i said within 24 hours i can almost guarantee they're they're entered in unless there's just a high call volume or uh, a weekend or an extended time that both myself and uh, bob dunlap's the other person would be away uh, but we've not had that situation yet the last thing is it does have the ability where you can manage the user accounts uh, so so as you get in there we have our approved users uh, whether they have the national map access, yes or no. Uh, this was, has become a lot more simpler, uh, a lot more simple here lately because we used to have the two levels of OD maps where you had the level one and you had the level two. Uh, level two being was basically that national map access that just had your, your national data and was data search only. Uh, and level one was for data entry. Uh, they've now merged both of those sites, so everyone should be using level one only, is, is my understanding. Uh, there's I've primarily only used level one as doing data entry, um, but my understanding is everyone should be using this same website, same system all, to, all together now. And that's pretty much how we enter one in. If I were to enter one in, it would take probably less than three minutes uh, from doing it, maybe a little bit longer if I have to find some GPS coordinates to it, but it is pretty uh, pretty easy to to enter those in. Does anybody have any questions on on how to enter one in or anything I can show them? Okay, Zach, I was gonna. This is Eric Vincent over here in Portland. Uh, the if you get a, a person who's overdosed on something that has a street name, like say M30s, are you gonna be marking like fentanyl? And then if there's a suspicion that there's um, meth in there that you would also then mark that? So with with that, that's a very good question because I'm, I, it's almost like every week I learn a new street name or something because the crews will uh, document it normally in quotes or something. Uh, if it's a street name that we're not really sure, we just have just a street name, a lot of times we'll select other. So from here, uh, I would just go with an other on there. Um, and then it gives you an ability to type this that drug name in uh, to where I can type in the street name that I, that I had there so that we can search it by that later on. Uh, and then for duplicate drugs, because sometimes people like to, to mix things together, that primary is we've just kind of used that definition of primary as the one that EMS is treating. So if they did something uh, where they had heroin and some meth in there, uh, if they were presenting as an upper, then we would put meth with heroin. If they had where we were downer, we were maybe given some naloxone and then turns out they took meth as well, then I would put heroin with methamphetamines, if that sort of makes sense. We kind of go based off of the way that patient is presenting on what that primary is. 
Thank you. And my other question was on multiple doses. Is that just a selection for anything over, say, two milligrams? Uh, or does once you click that, does that also then give you uh, a box to like fill in how many doses? It does not. It's, it's just just a generic. Of uh, you selected this one. It's just a, it puts it into that group. They could have gotten exactly two, or they could have gotten fifteen, and there would be no distinction. It was just that we had to use multiple doses of that. Um, I, I would like to share that, that something I would encourage your agencies to do um, as you start using ODMAP is we've been pretty lucky, um, well, lucky in some sense, but with only having two of us enter this data in, it really does help with consistency uh, because I'm guessing that if we polled all the participants and asked for a definition of what is an overdose, uh, you could get some pretty broad definitions there. Would you consider an overdose just because somebody gave Narcan? I've seen people give Narcan to someone that's awake and talking because they thought they needed to. So you can't really use that. Um, would you use it that they're not breathing? Well, I've seen a lot of overdoses that were still breathing, just not very well. Um, and so we've had to, Bob and myself have kind of worked pretty close to get a very good consistent thing. and. and is still very subjective, but the best that we've come up with is that if if their ingestion or injection of somehow these substances have created something for EMS to take care of, then that's kind of when we decided that it was an overdose. If, if somebody used methamphetamines and then broke their ankle, they may be high on methamphetamines, but I would not consider that an overdose because it's not affecting their care. If they use methamphetamines and now we need to slow their heart rate down, or to give some uh, maybe Ativan or something to help calm them down so they're not a danger to themselves or something, then I would consider that that was an overdose. Even though their vitals are, are stable, if it's affecting them uh, behaviorally or, or uh, some sort of psychiatric emergency that we need to prevent them from hurting themselves or someone else, then we've kind of considered that an overdose. So our, our kind of rough definition is, do they require treatment because of these that substance? Uh, even with alcohol, did that alcohol require them to have treatment by EMS is, is kind of been our, our kind of go-to definition. But if you have a, uh, like a law enforcement agency, I think law enforcement is great at a lot of things, but if they're, if they're not medically trained on how to identify that overdose, they may start using this as drug use detection. And, and, and I don't think that, I think that will dilute that down, especially with your spike alerts and everything like that. This isn't for this person took heroin. If they took heroin and didn't overdose, they should never be in this system. Even if EMS or law enforcement or first responders were called, that doesn't mean they need to be in this system. This is specifically for overdoses. So having some sort of clear definition uh, is difficult, but I, I think it really helps with consistency. I had a, a private question in the chat. Um, does HIPAA go out the window when someone overdoses or how is it that health, police, and EMS can all share identifiable information? Okay, uh, so there actually is a, maybe in the, in the there is a form that I will try to get to Mark to disseminate to everybody, and it's actually by multiple attorney generals that was signed off on this, uh, because we had some of the same questions. And so if you pay attention to the data that we're entering uh, is not very patient specific data. So we're using an address, but an address is identifiable, identifiable uh, through dispatch records, which in most jurisdictions are public records, because you're just saying that I went to this residence, not who was there. Uh, and, and so while we're using this and with law enforcement actually doesn't fall under as strict of a, a HIPAA because they don't really have patients in law enforcement. Uh, and, and so we can use some of this very generic data. I'm looking at a, an age and a gender. So that, that's still not identifiable to a, to a house uh, or anything of that nature. And so that's kind of been our route around HIPAA and, and I'll get that uh, it's from an attorney general, I believe that that explained how this did not fall under HIPAA. But I'll try to get that to Mark and send that out to everybody. Thank you. It's not a problem.
Do we have any other questions for Zach or Mark? Sorry, there is one in the chat. I'm trying to get data entered real time. Does ODMAP work offline similar to REDCap or does it require internet connectivity? You are gonna have some have to be required to have internet connectivity, uh, which is one of the hurdles that we've been trying to get over here is, is having consistent internet connectivity. For the nasal spray, I don't know if either of you know about this, but um so you don't have to breathe it in, I'm guessing, for it to be effective. Like, does it have like a really strong propulsion into your nose then? It, it does have a pretty good propulsion. Uh, I found it to be quite effective without any sort of breathing or even where they're breathing four times a minute with extremely slow breathing. Um, I've also had some times to where we've had to use a bag mask. And once we've used that bag mask a few times, uh, like two breaths that help just push that medicine in, it really did help them uh, get it. But the nasal sprays, we've had a whole lot of success with uh, little to no assistance, except for just that one click and that propulsion in there. The times that it hasn't worked, there's been a lot of sputum, a lot of snot, vomit, nastiness in their, in their nose, keeping it from getting to where it needs to be against that membrane. Dr. Brown commented that uh, in regards to the HIPAA issue, uh, he think it would he thinks it would fall under the public health exception for HIPAA. Any further questions? Just a reminder to fill out the survey uh, that's in the chat box. Uh, it'll help us improve the echoes. Um, and if there's no other questions or comments, thank you all so much for those great presentations. Uh, thank you, Zach and Mark. Um, we can go ahead and adjourn for today. Thank you very much. Thank y'all.